Really cool. So I, I, we have a great audience here. Christy's out in our audience, and we're going to go out to here, out to her, and see if we can uh, get some questions to challenge you all. Absolutely. A lot of great conversation here. But now that we have a better idea of the issues that we're dealing with, okay, now it's time to open it up to our audience and see what kind of questions we have. Who has a question? Anyone have a question? Oh, ma'am, step on up. We'll kind of take you in order a little bit. Come on over here. Stand next to me and go ahead and uh, tell us your name. My name is Susan Wardle. Okay, Susan, go ahead and uh, what's your question? My question is, I, I'm a science teacher and I would like to educate my students on some of the problems with the Great Lakes fisheries. Do you have any teaching resources or other materials that not only would educate them on the science behind what you're doing, but also making them more just astute and aware. Sure. Who wants to tackle that one first? Thanks so much, Susan. Sure, yeah, I think uh, you know, at SHED we've got a lot of resources for uh, learning and education for all levels. And so they do have uh, students come in from whether they're homeschooled, high school, uh, college level, elementary school, and we're very open to those sorts of interactions. So I would say definitely uh, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, we've got a lot of resources on specifically invasive species or habitat loss or the Great Lakes. And so those resources are definitely there I think it's just a matter of uh, reaching out and we're happy to act as that sort of outreach, uh, taking the science and sort of delivering it out to, uh, to the public. I think it's also being able to take advantage of either local programs or the state DNRs or through USGS or, or through the various Sea Grant institutions of getting people, getting students engaged in simple water quality monitoring and making that connection to the species and the biota that depend upon those healthy waters. All right, well, this discussion is going on online as well, so we have a question that came in from Twitter. Uh, the Twitter question was, can fish that have gone extinct from the Great Lakes be reintroduced? Is that a possibility? We were talking a little bit earlier about some fish that have uh, rebounded or reintroduced in, in specific lakes. Yeah, so in Lake Ontario, there's been a couple examples of this where, um, you know, if you're not able to rebuild from the current population that's there because either the species isn't there at all or there's such a limited genetic variability, you can, you know, work with the other, uh, you know, the other agencies and try to figure out what would be a good potential uh, match for a donor source. So for our lake trout restoration efforts and for this um, bloater restoration and lake herring, um, we need to do things like that. So it is possible, but you do need to take into account that maybe, you know, it wasn't the same strain that right. was originally in this lake. So there and, and could keep be a, a, a local lake extirpation or extinction, but if it's a present or a similar cousin or associated species is present in, in another lake, there's simple just a translocation over there. But it's we not have necessarily lost simple, but yeah. Simple. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but we have lost some species That's too, true. right? And, and in that case, if they've lost out of the Great Lakes, they no longer exist. Yep. All right, well, we have another question here. Hi, sir, go ahead, give us your name and your question. Yeah, Richard Mika with the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. Thanks to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and other environmental grants, we've been able to install artificial uh, spawning reefs for sturgeon. How important is it to monitor the results of these projects? Thanks, Richard. Go ahead, who wants to tackle that one first? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, I, there's. There's a, we've had a wonderful Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and, and rightly so, the money has been put in on the ground restorations. I am a firm believer that we need to connect a suite of the other efforts through internal funding of agencies and organizations to measure and monitor the impacts of those. We need, this to me is a big, a big test that we're putting on the landscape, and we have to make sure um, that we're getting the results, we're getting the payback, we're getting the return on those investments that we say. So the monitoring to me is, is has to be one of the high priorities. Yeah, I was just going to say it's important to know that if it doesn't have the predicted effect, it doesn't mean that it's a failure. I think the approach we're going to learn from and approaching it from the habit habitat side, we're going to see a, a lot of things happen that we wouldn't have thought about. So uh, monitoring is key and then also responding to those changes. What could we do next in, in terms of a reef restoration or a coastal wetland project to benefit native species over invasives? Salman, did you have anything to add? Because I know you're working on some projects too. Yeah, I think I, I want to reemphasize that uh, monitoring is extremely important. So we can put out those restoration efforts, but unless we keep track of them, I, the Great Lakes, you know, take some time to rebound sometimes. And so, uh, like USGS has 40-year data sets, and so sometimes we not see, you know, the response right away. So it's important to find out what's going on, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. I think that's extremely important. It's not just, you know, let's put it in for a year, three years, and then, you know, hope for the best. No, All right, who else has a question here? Anyone else want to come on up? Go ahead, Patrick, you want to finish your thought? I would we'll also have our next just question? add that if we don't monitor and measure, we'll never know when we reach our goals. 
we'll just never know. And so it, then it can be a case of, well, more or more. But we got to know when we get to our, our goals. All right. Hi there. Go ahead. Give us your name and tell us your question. Uh, my name is Amy Meeker-Taylor. Um, and my question is, as a graduate student at Miami University, I surveyed the residents of St. Clair County, Michigan, about their level of awareness about the Great Lakes and issues. Um, and what I found is that those who use the lake for recreation are much more likely to know about the issues and also to engage in sustainable behaviors. So I'm curious if you guys know what's being done or what can be done to get more people out on the water, especially those who have like a socioeconomic barrier. That's a great question because engagement and getting people to understand what we're talking about is a huge issue and part of the reasons why we do programs like this. But who wants to tackle that first off? Go ahead. Andy. Yeah, I think there's, uh, that's a great question, Amy. There's a lot that can be done. There's a lot of opportunities for people to get involved at the local level, just in their local watersheds. They don't even have to be out on the lakes. Um, and there's also a lot of resources available for uh, you know, boating and how to boat safely and not uh, spread invasive species. So th there's a lot of things that can be done and a lot of educational programs that get people aware. Yeah, I think it, it's, it can be a difficult thing. Obviously, people that are more invested in, in the lakes for whatever, you know, whatever their use is, whether they like fishing or boating or, you know, taking wildlife photographs, those people tend to know a lot more about the resources. Um, I think teachers can do a lot um, to have Great Lake, you know, modules. Uh, we have participated for a few years in a, with a program with our uh, local New York Sea Grant where teachers actually uh, come around and have training. They come to our station and other stations uh, and talk about, you know, learn about the resource so that they can pass it on. Uh, I think there are a lot of great outreach programs um, like, the, like the shed that Solomon mentioned and through the Sea Grants that, you know, hopefully just the more people that are talking about it will get the, you know, get the awareness level raised. And, and Thanks, Amy. Thank slightly related topic, um, you know, in, in Western Lake Erie, I believe it's Ohio Sea Grant has made uh, boat trips available for agricultural producers that are much further away in the watershed. And, and, and the hypothesis is that if we can get those people there and see, then there's much more accountability and much more understanding of, of impacts and the, and the relative role that any one industry. So I think we need to continue to make those connections. It's all about those connections. All right, in the last minute that we have left, I want to get to one last Twitter question. You're talking a lot about inv of invasive species, um, but specifically someone wants to know what happens if Asian carp get into the Great Lakes and what other invasives would you be worried about as well? So Solomon, you're right, right in the middle of an Asian carp, yeah. carp, 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 right where that spotted gar was sure. sitting. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully the the gar can help us with the yeah. with the carp. Um, being in Chicago, we're sort of right at that nexus, that point. You know, one of the most, I guess, uh, well publicized points of connection between the Great Lakes and also the Mississippi River, where Asian carp may be po uh, posed to, to enter. Uh, what we can do now is just monitor. You know, continue monitoring for if they, you know, can get in. It's important to point out that they have not established a population, as far as we know, in the Great Lakes. So preventing that invasion is definitely important, and uh, continuing to monitor the habitats that we have in the Great Lakes as is to know how they can be resistant, enhance those habitats to resist invasion. So I think that's extremely important when it comes to Asian carp. All right, well, we are now rounding into the final minutes and Patrick, want to go ahead and give us a little bit your kind of my final thoughts here. Yeah, a great discussion. It's just a lot of fun. I, I, I love the passion of the discussion and I love the knowledge and the interest and incredible breadth of understanding. And I think you get from this is that, you know, the Great Lakes and these fisheries are ultimately tied to, to us, whether again, you're the one out there fishing or you're the one up in the watershed uh, enjoying the benefits of those fisheries. Um, but again, it's, it's a perfect opportunity. We have lots of opportunity. We talked about the advances in restoration, the advances in tools, the advances in techniques, the advances in education. We are at a moment now where we're seeing great opportunity um, for restoration of a native component of the fishery that's going to add a stability um, and diversity to this. So thanks a ton. If you want to learn more, you can go to nature.org slash glfish and back to you, Christy. All right, sounds good. And that is going to do it for Great Lakes Now Connect. Thanks to Patrick, of course, and all of our special guests. Plus a big thanks to our studio audience right here at Detroit Public Television. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation today about Great Lakes fisheries and that today's show has inspired you to find out more. So just go to our website, greatlakesnow.org. All of the information will be there for you. Plus you can share this show with your friends. For all things Great Lakes, you can follow us on Twitter and you give us the old, you know, thumbs up, a like on Facebook. And finally, a big thanks to our partners at The Nature Conservancy of Michigan for all of their hard work. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for watching and we will see you next time.